And John McAuliffe was involved for many years before becoming a Cuba specialist, which he is dealing with the Indochina Reconciliation Project. He was involved very early in the game. Uh, as a teenager, almost way back, he was involved in efforts to, to promote dialogue between the U.S. and Indochina, Vietnam, et cetera, when things were very different from what they are now, right after the, right, right after the, war, and, uh, the, the war ended, shortly before. So he's very knowledgeable about, about that process of the U.S., reconciling, kind of normalizing relations with countries in this case, in a very much more difficult case than, uh, than Cuba actually is uh, for the U.S. and in general in global affairs, given that there was a war there, a very costly war in human life. So John is very knowledgeable about the, event, about the process, and then he has been going to Cuba periodically. He just came back from Cuba, I understand, right, John? Yeah, two nights ago. And he's running some initiatives in Cuba he may tell us about, you may want to ask him later. So we're going to ask him to go first and then he present uh, an update on what's happening in Cuba. John. Um, first, thank you. I mean, I've come for many years and learned a tremendous amount from your sessions and the diversity of people that participate in them. So I think you and, and the Bildner Center are to be honored for what you have accomplished in the sometimes difficult environment of New York City, which has its own challenges. Um, I am a practitioner much more than an academic or theoretician, although uh, being a practitioner of things related to Cuba inherently makes one a theoretician to some extent, if you to follow, find your way through. I came up with a topic when I was invited that was normalization almost home or not, which obviously left me a lot of room to wiggle through. Um, and I want to start out with these pictures rather than ending with them, because I'm afraid I'll run out of time, and they're important. Um, this is the picture that you probably saw. This is the baseball game. This is what Morning Joe, I got, I was in Cuba for the flag raising, I was in Cuba for the president's visit, I just got back from the party congress time. I mean, that's not prescience, it has to do with other work that I'm doing happened to get me there at those times. When I got back the next morning, Morning Joe was all over the president for not having left Cuba not having, not, he should have not gone to the baseball game. He should have flown, and one person said to Brussels, which would have obviously been very welcomed by the Belgian authorities, or another said he should have come back to Washington to do what it wasn't clear, but that was the theme. They just went, showed this picture over and over and over again. And one can guess what their motive was and how much it had to do with a generalized attack on Obama and his foreign policy, or a specific way of trying to undermine the Cuba event. This is the picture you didn't see. This is the beginning of the baseball game. First of all, as those of you who know Cuba, baseball is not just a game. Baseball was the national symbol of independence, as I think I can't remember if it's Vieira or Rafael Hernandez, tells the story that Jose Vieira or Rafael Hernandez that in the 19th century, if you, support, if you were supporting and writing about bullfights, that meant you supported the Spanish. If you were interested in supporting baseball, that meant you were pro-independence. So going to a baseball game is not only touching on a common cultural theme, it's touching on something very important in, in the bringing together historically of the two countries in the 19th century. Um, the beginning of Obama's speech to the na Cuban nation, which was broadcast and probably had a higher viewership than anything in Cuba. Um, he also started out by talking about Brussels, and then as I say, at the baseball game, they did this moment of silence. The, the three people, um, 
Next to Obama, of course, is Raul Machado Ventura and then Diaz Canel. The not Machado Ventura? No. Esteban Lasso. Oh, I just assumed it was. Shows how good my visual. Okay, what was Esteban Lasso doing there then? Ah, so they upped that priority. Okay, good. Always good to be corrected. And Diaz Canel, the vice president, the first vice president, then the legal successor. Um, this is what was also going on at the baseball game. Uh, if in America, Diplomacy and business takes place on the golf course in Cuba at the baseball stadium. And this is the beginning of the game. Now, it is hard. I mean, we've been saying for years that once the basic decision took place, it would be hard to understand why it took so long to happen, because it seemed so natural. And so it is now natural. Every poll in the United States shows, as we knew from pre-normalization polls, that there's 60, 65% of Americans are supporting the president's initiatives. Coincidentally or not, the Obama numbers, his general po positive numbers, have gone up steadily since his December announcement of diplomatic relations. It may be coincidence, but I like to think that was more than that. At any rate, um, but who could have, it was one of those things that until it happened, everybody said it was impossible. The famous third rail in American politics and the fact that uh, the, the, in, the political balances within the US did not permit it. But once he did it, he did it. Uh, and it, the question is, does it stay? I would say short of Ted Cruz becoming president, which has other consequences, um, I don't think there's going to be a turnaround. Um, uh, Trump says he could have made a better deal, but he's somebody who honors deals when they're made. Um, Kasich, if you look around the edges, is clearly part of that consensus within the corporate Republican Party that think it's about time. Um, I, For a variety of reasons, I would have preferred Bernie Sanders, but one of them was I think he's stronger on Cuba than is Hillary Clinton. But in any case, she's now completely invested in the policy, uh, regardless of what her sister-in-law says. So, And we don't know where her sister-in-law is. Her sister-in-law is a Cuban-American lawyer who was very influential in the first Clinton, in the Clinton administrations and retarding stuff within the White House. Um, and I don't know, the right has split obviously and dramatically in Miami and I've not talked to anybody who knows which side of that split she is on. This is you Rodham's wife. Um, I think there's a couple of interesting things that show how both the challenges and the definitiveness of what's happened. When both presidents entered it, I mean, this is sort of dismissed always just after his legacy. Well, yeah, but that's not a bad thing to want to have, is a legacy that in which, as Nixon did with China, Clinton did with Vietnam, Obama has done now both with Cuba and with Iran. Um, I mean, that's an honorable legacy to put in the history books. For, for Raul, the legacy is, in some sense, is even more poignant. From the first moment he became the controlling official in Cuba, he's talked about the danger, the, iron, the irony, the terrible irony that those who created the revolution would also be those who lost the revolution. That unless they made fundamental changes, things were going to go out of control when they passed away. And so that's what the strategy is about on an internal basis. I thought it was very interesting that, that in both cases, the presidents did not trust their foreign ministries. They had all of the secret negotiations take place. In the case of Raul, his son, Alejandro, who's head of the National Security Council, was the lead actor. It was not. Uh, the foreign minister or 
people in the foreign ministry that normally deal with America stuff. We don't know how much they were in consultation, but we know they were not the people in the room. The case of Obama, State Department was also totally cut out. Uh, it was his national security advisor and a young guy in the NSC who were the secret negotiators. Um, there was a, a cute statement. I mean, you have to sort of follow all of these things. Uh, in the remarks of the two presidents before they went into their private meeting, um, they, uh, Raul says, after talking almost identical language to Obama about uh, no one should entertain illusions and how much we have to do and how much we have to overcome from the 50 years. He makes this comment, and we hope that our closest assistants, part of them are here with us today, we hope that they will follow the instructions of both presidents. Okay. Um, Raul denies that there are two parties uh, within the Communist Party. I think that's correct. There are certainly two tendencies within Cuban social and cultural life, uh, one of which erupted partially through Fidel's letter, but then through a series of academic papers in Cuba Debate and other places, and through a comment made by uh, the foreign minister in the, in the party Congress, um, just heavy duty piling on against the language that Obama used in his national address to Cubans. Um, I have to say, from every Cuban I talk to, while people might or might not have agreed with every point, Obama scored very big with the Cuban people, with all of these folks watching it. And I think that that was not unanticipated by the people in Cuba who want reform, who are now using the word reform, who are now using the word private, uh, words that they didn't use very much when this process started. And that's an, it also an echo of the, what happened in Vietnam, that the language is behind what the reality is. Um, I'm, I want to keep track of the time, because I could go on for the full two hours without the least bit of hesitation. Um, Ten more minutes. OK. Both countries have internal factors pulling them backwards. There's no question about that. In, uh, I mean, it 50 plus years of hostility, I mean, the sort of the the love-hate relationship, the closeness is also the conflict. Um, and that's true whether you're Cuba and the US, Vietnam and China, Ukraine and Russia, Ireland and England. I mean, you closeness creates its own set of problems. Um, and while for Obama, the risk level is only reputational uh, in his how they write the history books, for Raul, the risk level is existential. The question of how to manage a transformation out of 50 years of investment of people's lives and spirits and beliefs and to find ways of modernizing that that maintain what's really important in the revolution as far as the education and health and the sort of sense of community that is unique, as those of you who travel in Cuba know, is unique in Cuba, of anywhere in the Caribbean and anywhere in Latin America, and more so even than Vietnam, which is the other, and Laos and Cambodia, which are the other countries that I'm familiar with in this sort of process. I mean, this, this sense of mutuality, it's not, I don't want to be utopian about it because every Cuban I know has big gates on their door and big gates on their windows. So they're not, um, have the, don't have an illusion that somehow uh, they've, they've made it into uh, the promised land as far as uh, their fellow citizens. But, but they do have, seem to have still a sense of community. One, one person says, well, partially it's they don't have all of the, media stuff that constantly assaults us and 
we're constantly linked to. So there may be a good, good part of the internet delays. Um, the other thing that, that is different is the sense of history. Um, the, when President Obama spoke, he didn't deny the history. But he did say, I know the history, but I refuse to be trapped by it. Well, that's very fine to say. However, there is still an embargo, right, which is about the most classic form of economic warfare you can undertake and does have, you know, as the Cubans say, a blockade kind of impact on their economy. Even when they try to change these things, as they did, as the US government did in the last couple of rounds of regulatory changes, um, it's now in theory possible for the Cubans to use the dollar internationally. That is, the financial blockade has been alleviated, but it ain't happened yet. I mean, the foreign minister said something that was very smart. He said, OK, we're going to try it. And if it turns out to be true, then we'll do away with this 10% penalty on the dollar exchange. But they've been trying for a month now, and it's not happening. Um, I was talking to a head of one of the Cuban tourism companies or receiving companies who said the problem is the banks, that the banks will not let the money go through because they're, they're setting up a whole process when it could get turned around by the election. Um, they're just not willing to do that. And you, the president would almost have to bring them into his office and sign in blood that no future administration is going to come fine you a billion dollars. But uh, that's so, even though in principle it's there, in practice it's very hard. The Cuban Adjustment Act it, and the paroling, special parole for doctors working abroad is also not history. It's there right now. Although Senator Rubio has just come out for ending it. So we may actually be uh, seeing the end of that particular horror story. Um, the holding of Guantanamo. I mean, there's no one serious. The US military hasn't won on Guantanamo for 20 years. And there is no one serious in international law who could argue that the US legitimately has Guantanamo. It's known as what's classically an unequal treaty. The only reason we have it is because that was the price of Cuba gaining its independence and us taking our forces out of Havana at the turn of the century. So, I mean, it stood, couldn't, the only reason it hasn't gone to the international courts is the Cubans have always had higher priorities. But it's, there's, there's objectively no reason why Obama couldn't, in his last two months of office, say, here, <laughs> and that also solves this problem of what to do with the prisoners. I mean, maybe he leases prison space on the Cuban Guantanamo, as was suggested by Parmley, the former head of the intersection. But at any rate, um, so, and obviously, as long as we're spending tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars every year on Radio Marti, TV Marti, which has no other purpose than subsidizing the right wing in Miami, since nobody can see it or hear it in Cuba, um, and the democracy programs, which Congress forces upon the State Department, and then the State Department has to come up with things that try to sound as innocuous as possible. But they don't go so far as to tell the Cubans, OK, let's negotiate these programs, and, we'll have and you'll have ultimate control over them which is obviously what you do. It's what the US does with USAID programs and other civil society programs all over the world. They do not go into a friendly country without the approval of that country's government. So, but as long as those things exist, history is not behind us. Um, let me say a couple of things finally. The, It is, again, many of you know Cuba better than I, but it is very clear um, it's not just a psychological problem, it's an institutional problem that certain institutions grew up to meet certain needs, and the Cubans are no different than the Americans or the Brits or the French or anybody else. If you have power, if you have influence, 
you're gonna hang on to it as long as you can. And it takes a real, Raul says they're not gonna do shock therapy. Um, I'm encouraged the fact that he spent so much time in his address, the party Congress talking about the currency problem. Maybe they actually are moving to solve that uh, unification issue. But um, it's, it's, you're dealing, and he's very frank about the fact that some of his biggest problem is internal. There is this big debate, if you're following it, as to why was this Congress organized in a different fashion. In the past, a party Congress and other major national events don't take place without extended discussion at the grassroots, leading often to changes of documents. That's not what happened this time. This time, the documents only went out to the 1,000 people who were going to the Congress and some other selected higher ranking people. There's been a lot, there was, what's fascinating is there was overt criticism of that in Cuba uh, by intellectuals and party activists saying, hey, how can this happen? Well, the two theories, which I found people that I trust entirely in their judgment in Cuba, one said it was because they were afraid of the right, that is the more conservative people in the party, and that if it went to the base that even the changes they'd made so far, there'd be a reaction against because some people are being hurt by price inflation and uncertainties about what's gonna happen. Or there's another theory that it was fear that if it went to the base, the base is so disgusted and so anxious to have more dramatic change that it would have been pressure in that direction. So as I say, these are two people whose names I won't mention, but you've heard them speak here. Um, totally opposite views of why it didn't happen. Now what's fascinating in the process is what they've taken is the two major documents that went to the Congress, including, in a sense, the theoretical concept of what Cuban socialism is about now, are not final. They're going out now to the base, and it's unclear. Some of the language makes it sound like it's only going to party organizations at the base, but other language suggests that, again, they will reach out to large swath of people, and so that it will be building. And it's very clear that those documents can then come back to the Central Committee. Um, the Central Committee, uh, we'll see over the next week or so as we begin to get all of the names identified for the Politburo and the Central Committee, but there are some positive glimmerings of age and sex and race in terms of the membership of the Central Committee um, and in terms, uh, at least in terms of some personalities on the Politburo. So, I mean, we will get all of the stuff from our friends in Havana who will be identifying it. One thing is, those of you who work with the University of Havana, the rector is not noted as a great progressive force. Um, he lost his seat on the Central Committee. Um, this is a week after he fired Everlenny from the Center for the Study of the Cuban Economy. Nobody says there's a relationship between those two things, but Everlenny is a trusted advisor of Murillo and of, therefore, of Raul. So Everlenny's sacked, the rector loses his slot. The person who, in a sense, replaced him was a woman who is the head of the informatics university. The, uh, the, um, and the informatics university, according to all my Cuban friends, is a place where, needless to say, there are a lot of people who want the internet to build up as quickly and as widely as possible, because that's going to be their bread and butter over their whole lives. So at any rate, I think it's, it's a thing in process. It isn't going to go backwards. I have no fear that Ted Cruz is going to be elected president. So I think we are in not an immediate process. I mean, remember, the con only the Congress can really end the embargo. Um, but the president can push more holes into it. And let's see what happens if a Democrat is elected or if a Republican is elected, what happens in the lame duck, what he does to make it easier for his successor to deal with some of the harder stuff. 
As a bottom line also is we have to realize that for Cuba, these are one-way decisions. Once you've moved away from the model of the past, almost impossible to be returned. Uh, in the US, I also think it's almost impossible to return, but probably a little easier. Thank you. Thank you, John. So the next speaker is going to be Hillary, who is going to be addressing issues of tourism and hopefully uh, current trends and reactions to the to the Congress. Okay. Well, again, thank you very much for the the invite. Um, my name is Hillary Becker. I have uh, worked with the Cubans for about 15 years. I did my PhD uh, with the Centro de Estudios de la Economía Cubana uh, with Fernando Gutierrez. Some of you might uh, might know him. But uh, what I'm going to be uh, talking about here today is the the, the tourism aspects. Uh, obviously, you can get into so many different areas, but I'll try to keep uh, the talk more around the, the the tourism side of things. So I thought I'd just start with what each side is saying about this. So from Obama's standpoint, uh, the future of Cuba is to be decided by the Cubans, uh, not by the Americans. And Castro is saying, you're not going to budge an inch. So um, the ideals of the independence, social justice, and surrender, are we're not going to surrender even a single one of our principles, uh, or concede a millimeter our defense of the national sovereignty. So from both sides of things, we're seeing that uh, it's essentially going to be in the hands of the Cubans to, to move forward on this. So um, I, again, from the uh, tourism standpoint, I thought I would just introduce a couple of the timelines. Uh, I didn't hit, obviously, all the, the major things. There has been so many things that have been happening. But going right back to, to 2009, uh, when Obama starts to ease the restrictions, the American Ballet was, uh, was something that was fairly substantial from a cultural standpoint. Uh, then we get into the people-to-people -people exchange. Obviously, the announcement um, uh, that occurred in December 20 or 17th, 2014. Talk about the, the implications of that a little bit later on uh, from a tourism standpoint. We saw some very interesting things happen in January of 2015. But then we get into, uh, in 2015, a number of things started to really progress. Uh, as John mentioned, uh, Obama can't um, obviously lift the, the embargo himself, that it's an act of Congress, but he's opened Pandora's box. He's pushed the door open, and the floodgate's moving forward, so it won't be able to be closed. So a couple of the uh, various polls. Obviously, the, the Mariel Harbor is a very significant component of this, uh, the implications uh, associated with that, especially with Nicaragua and the, uh, the canal that'll be a gateway through to, to China. Uh, as a result, Airbnb now has over 2,000 um, rooms which are listed uh, there. Uh, Cheap Air becomes the first online travel agency. Uh, U.S. drops the, um, the really big one was when U.S. dropped the um, state-sponsored terrorism uh, marker for, for Cuba. That allowed a lot of companies to start to say, OK, we're going to start to see some real movement here. <clears throat> Then to get into 2016, when Obama makes the uh, the visit, the the Rolling Stones, they weren't the first Amer or first big group to go. There was another group that went the uh, the week before. Uh, the Rolling Stones, obviously, the baseball game uh, was also significant. I have a signed baseball from Pedro Luis Lazo, so that might go up in value. Throw out the first pitch at the game. Um, I just last night Usher was uh, performing down in Havana. Usher and um, Dave Matthews uh, together, so they were down there. But there was also a number of businesses that went with, and those businesses have been meeting with the Cubans for more than 15 years. The original talks were taking place over in Cancun, but uh, virtually every, every governor along with business groups have been uh, meeting with Cubans for, for at least 15 years. Um, interesting, when um, California went, the uh, some people from Vegas went with them, uh, but they were told that they weren't welcome in Cuba. So there, we'll talk a bit uh, about the, the, the cruises um, and uh, the, the first mail service, which is also a fairly significant aspect here. So just to start off with, I thought I'd put up some, some graphics. Uh, these are some of the, from the official statistics. 
But we can see that there has been a steady rise of, of tourism over the years, but the real significant jump occurs in the last two years. So was, there was a, a slight increase from 2009. I'm taking it back to 2009, so that's when Obama makes the announcement and see what happens beyond that. But we see that 2014, 2015, and the expectation is 3.7 million this year. Um, interesting, I've got a couple of them highlighted here. When we take a look, Canada has always been the, the number one group that goes down there. Um, that's why I, I'm allowed to go down there. I've been visiting Cuba now, I don't know, somewhere around 100 times or so. Uh, but Canada's always been, been the number one group. But the other traditional groups, when I used to go back in the 90s and uh, early 2000s, that it was always people from Italy and Spain. Those were the other two major groups. But take a look at what happened. From Obama's announcement in 2009, Spain went from 129,000 down to 77,000. Italy went from 118 down to 95 and then has had a rebound in the last year. So the traditional groups that have been supporting and going down to Cuba have been moving and going to other locations, a lot of them going to the DR. Part of the reason for that, though, if you think about it, is 2008 was the economic crisis. Uh, so it's the rebound from that which is affecting, uh, that's a, a fairly expensive travel to go from Europe to, to the Caribbean for a holiday. Um, the occupancy has been fairly stable. Um, the, the number of rooms there, that's the actual physical number of rooms, uh, 60,600 going up to 63,000. So there hasn't been a lot of movement in the rooms, but I will talk a little bit about that again going forward. Where are tourists staying? This is another interesting component of this. We see that the three, um, the, the international travelers have been moving up from the three-star to the four-star hotels. So they're moving up and we're seeing more, 70% of the hotels are now four and five-star hotels. And that's, that's an important component to be able to compete in the, the, the Caribbean as a whole. But when we take a look at the domestic Cuban travelers, they're moving from the two to three-star. And I just showed the 2009 to 2014, but those trends are a steady decline and a steady increase. And that's part of the, uh, the small business ownership and people having money and the increase in the remittances coming down from, um, from Florida, essentially, which is allowing people to, to visit um, or to stay in the hotels. So we are seeing that being a very important component. Actually, Cubans are now the number two group in Veradero. So they're the number two tourist group behind the Canadians. Uh, Cuban, Cuban, Cuban Americans. No, no, Cuban Cubans. Cuban Cubans. <laughs> yeah, have to specify. So the uh, the Cubans, yeah. But when we take a look at the the, the January in indications here, um, the visitors, and this is going just January, which is one of the most important months for for tourism. We're seeing the increase going from 292,000 up to 417,000 in 2016, representing a 12.7% growth. And if we take a look at the, the, the first quarter of 2016, we see it's up right across the board. So there's a lot more tourists going to Cuba. And again, that's going from that 3 million to 3.5 million people. Um, and again, the, the expectation is 3.7 million. So at the bottom of this slide here, what I have is the indications and the expectations that we're expecting to see in Cuba this year. So the, the first thing is that they hit a million tourists 11 days earlier than they did last year. So that's an indication that, again, more people are, are going. Um, we're seeing the number of tourist days, like the, rather than tourists themselves, but the number of tourist days, 24.7 million for international travelers, that's up 12.3%, and 6.8 million for Cubans themselves. Uh, and that's up 13, it should be 13.8%. There is an increase in rooms. As I said, there wasn't a lot of increase over the last six or so, uh, five or six years, but we're seeing 3,700 new rooms and 5,600 rooms are being upgraded. So that's, uh, that's to be able to handle the expectations of greater amounts. But we're also seeing that to handle that uh, explosion of tourists and really the, the, the tourists that are... Um, wanting to, to get the real Cuba experience, they stay in the Casa Particulars. It's also a lot cheaper. But that used to be 9,000 back in, to, just in um, 2014, and the expectation is that'll be up to 19,000 this year. So that's a, a, a doubling of the, the number of Casa Particulars. Formatur is also um, being involved in that because they're offering free, uh, free counseling and free courses for people that are taking the Casa Particulars and then specialized courses beyond that that they can pay for. Uh, so specialized courses for, uh, for these, uh, the people that are running the rooms if they want specialized training in certain areas. 
uh, bookkeeping and um, general management, how to how to uh, how to attract people, all those sort of different things. One of the other aspects here, as I mentioned, was when we take a look at 2014. Um, oh, sorry, after the uh, after the announcement on 2000, December uh, 2014 by Obama, if you take a look at what happened in January of 2015, Canada was up by 15 percent. And that's compared to the year before. Germany was up by 38%, UK was up by 32%, and France was up by 26%. So the tourism, right after Obama made the announcement, was much higher by all the groups that wanted to get in there, well, before you guys get there. <laughs> Say that from the Canadian standpoint. But that was the that was the expectation. That's then everybody you talk to that is uh, you know that is traveling, talk to the travel agencies. And that's the ex, that's what they're hearing is people want to travel before it opens up to uh, to the Americans. I'm, I'm okay with it myself. Uh, I was in Cancun. I was talking about this when I was about 16 years old. I was in Cancun. It was a little fishing village at that time. Now it's like going to downtown Miami. Mm -hmm. So it, it's very much uh, changed, and that's what a lot of people are are kind of worried about. Two of the major things that I did want to talk about was the uh, was the cruises as well as um, what's going on with the airports, because that's going to be major drivers of the, the tourism industry. Uh, you're probably following this, what's going on with Carnival Cruises. They're supposed to do their inaugural uh, sail to Cuba on May 1st, but the, the law is right now that uh, Cuban-born U.S. residents are prohibited from entry into Cuba by sea. They're, it's okay for them to go in by plane, but they can't enter by sea. So they've blocked anybody that's a Cuban-American from being able to travel. And that's led to, to lawsuits. But it, uh, what I was going to talk about was uh, Carnival's response here, because that's an interesting thing from an uh, American business standpoint, which goes to the idea that you're saying they don't want to uh, invest all the money if everything can just turn around again. I mean, the same thing, because I'm an accountant myself, uh, so I'm a CPA. And um, we run into the same thing. Here in, here in the States, there is US GAAP. The rest of the world uses IFRS, the International Financial Reporting Standards. And it costs companies as much as $50 million to transfer over to the IFRS. So transfer the accounting principles. So companies don't want to spend $50 million to transfer and update their systems, and then all of a sudden things change right back. The, the air traffic uh, is, is going to be one of the other issues that we have. 110 flights have now been, uh, now been given uh, permission, 20 into Havana, 90 into the other areas. But it was oversubscribed, 50 uh, 50 um, flights were asked for by the different airline charters, which I have here. The main issue here will be the hubs. So these are the main hubs that are expected to get the, the travel. JFK, Atlanta, Miami, Charlotte, and Newark would be the top five. Uh, and this is the, the hubs of these, uh, these companies, of these airlines. But what we could see is that the air traffic, um, what Cuba could lead to, and this is sort of, I guess, where I'll finish without the other... 20 slides, um, but, uh, but we could see that, uh, we could uh, see an increase. What I've got is uh, slides that relate to D uh, Cuba versus the Dominican Republic versus Jamaica versus the other countries. And in Punta Cana, they went from 783,000 at their airports up to 5.2 million. So Cuba has the, the possibility to do that. If we take a look at just 2014, Cuba versus the Dominican Republic, on a year, like for the entire year, Cuba was at 58% relative to the number of uh, tourists that, uh, that the DR had. In the first three months of 2015, they had 75%. So there's a, a substantial increase of people going to Cuba versus uh, Dominican, and they're increasing. And again, we, see, we could see this increase. Can Cuba handle that? That's been the big issue. If we look at the, the currently they have 63,000 rooms. Um, 2020, they're expecting 85,500 rooms, and by 2030, their 20-year their, uh, plan calls for the potential of 200,000 rooms. So they will have the capacity to equal <clears throat> what is happening um, in what's going on with the, with the DR. And if I could just one minute. Okay, so just one minute just to talk about some of the significant areas where we're going to see uh, the increase in tourism. Obviously, the, the curiosity and cultural tourism, Cuba has the, the art galleries, the, the museums. For people that don't want to go to the beach, health and medical tourism is a $55 billion industry worldwide. 
Uh, Cuba has cancer treatments. They've got treatments which reduce diabetic food or foot amputations uh, by 80%. Luxury tourism, that's why they're going after the four and five star. Actually, the, the Royal Cayo Santa Maria um, ranked number 19 in the world uh, for um, all inclusives, and they have six of the, the top 25 in the Caribbean. Golf course communities is something that Raul still is talking about. And if you think Trump might get in, that's why it took me a long time to get here. I had to get over the wall to, to get down here. But uh, Trump's looking for a better deal. And if you look at his, uh, well, actually his statements, 50% of his revenues come from golf courses. So to think that he's not going to want to get in there is, uh, is something. Um, diving, obviously there's, there's huge opportunities for diving. Event tourism, like the, the Stones, 200 technicians went with the, the Rolling Stones to train the, the Cubans how to uh, put on uh, events like that. Um, baseball conferences, festivals. Right now, The Fast and the Furious um, is filming. Uh, so Hollywood's going to be pounding down the doors to get into Cuba. And um, cultural and ecotourism. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, after listening to Hillary, I like to change to a bathing suit and go back to Havana. <laughs> so I'd like to uh, thank the Builder Center for inviting me to, uh, to talk to you, to be part of this panel, and to talk about uh, another important sector of the Cuban economy, which is agriculture. I'm Mario Gonzalez Corso. I'm an economist at, uh, at Lehman College. I'm also affiliated with the Builder Center with the Cuba Project. So. Um, in my presentation today, I'll talk about the, uh, the importance of, the, of, Cuban agri of agriculture in the Cuban economy. I'll talk a little bit about, uh, just to frame these thoughts in perspective, about the emerging agricultural model that's been taking place in Cuba since 2007. Um, then we'll uh, summarize uh, the principal reforms that have taken place in agriculture, and then I'll talk about Two, maybe two or three basic indicators of performance, and then what have we learned about the prospects for agriculture from the Seventh uh, Party Congress that was just culminated in Cuba. And so when we look at agriculture, I'm citing the work of a, of a colleague and also a, a, long, uh, a long time esteemed uh, uh, affiliated uh, member or colleague here at the Builder Center, and one of the professors uh, from the University of Havana, Armando Nova Gonzalez, has for many years um, indicated in his research the importance of agriculture in the Cuban economy. And so agriculture, if you look at the percentage of agriculture, the contributions of agriculture to GDP, looking at official statistics, you'll get something like four to 5% of GDP. But indirectly, when we include indirect contributions, we're talking about 20% of GDP. Now, taking GDP at uh, 97 constant prices for 2014, Cuba reported a GDP of 62.3 billion pesos, which, by the way, the way that the national account are reported in Cuba, that's equal to 63.3 billion US dollars. And so agriculture, based on our estimates, accounts for around 20%, and so 20% is about 12.4 billion pesos. So you can see it's a, it's a very significant sector of the economy. It also makes a significant contribution to nutrition. And Cuba, by nature, is an agricultural country. In fact, the tourism sector and agriculture are, are linked. The fortunes of tourism and the fortunes of agriculture are, are positively correlated. And so agriculture provides around 40% of the daily caloric intake of Cuba and about 37% of the proteins consumed by the Cuban population. Another interesting finding, just to highlight how significant agriculture is and why we need to talk about it in, in, you know, in this panel about the, the Congress, is obviously that around 20% of the labor force, that's over a million people, are directly and indirectly employed in the agricultural sector. And then the final number, that we estimated was that we have about 4 million individuals, that's around 36% of the Cuban population, somehow dependent economically or related economically to agriculture. And so if you look at the average size of the typical Cuban household, we're talking somewhere pretty close to about a million households in Cuba, about uh, 
uh, a million that are dependent or somewhat related to agriculture. And of course, when we look at agriculture, the lineamentos that, the lineamentos that were approved in the previous uh, Congress of the Communist Party really gave a lot of priority to agriculture. And from that, uh, we, uh, Cuba has developed an emerging agricultural model. So what, what are the features of the new agricultural model that, uh, that has emerged in Cuba? Well, the first one is the expansion of horizontal relations between different forms of agricultural producers. And we're talking about supply chain management and input procurement. Decentralization in supply chain management and input procurement. The other one is diversification. And diversification, not in the financial sense when we talk about diversification of financial assets, but diversification of productive forms. This is very unique in the sense that it's a follow-up to what happened in Cuba during the beginning of the special period. More decentralization, the expansion of cooperatives, and you know, the different forms of cooperatives, and of course, private farming, and another kind of producer, which are the usufructuarios. The usufructuarios are the lessees of the land, of the state land that has been transferred since 2008 and 2013. So these are the individuals that are not private farmers per se, but they're lessees in short-term leases from the state, and they are, uh, their, their agricultural production is also increasing. The third feature of the agricultural model, of course, is decentralization of economic decision-making. And that, what I mean, uh, what, what I have to explain about that is that it's decentralization not only in the functions of the uh, administrative apparatus, but also decentralization by removing the emphasis from the top down to a localized emphasis on agricultural decisions. So an emphasis on the municipality and highlighting local decision making, decentralized local decision making. So Cuban agriculture, despite of the emergence of a new model, it's confronted with several challenges. And I'm basically highlighting just a few here. The first one, and I'll show you some data uh, showing this later, uh, it's insufficient declining production in key uh, output categories or key uh, crop categories. The second challenge is that Cuba has around 15.3% of all the agricultural land remains idle. The Cuban government reports it as tierras ociosas, which means, of course, land that has a, uh, the potential to be harvested, but it's not being utilized. By the way, in the state sector, the percentage is more than half. So this is the overall, the, the, the global figure, and we have the, uh, the breakdown of the state and the non-state sector. In the non-state sector, it's about half of the national average. So half of 15%, around 7.5% of the land owned by the non-state sector is idle. The rest is productive. So you can see why there's, there's discussion about expanding the, the participation, the contributions of the non-state sector. Another, another constraint, of course, as you know, is uh, administrative restrictions, the lack of economic incentives, and difficulties with procurement, supply chain, uh, processing, you know, the, the, the processing infrastructure, and the deteriorated conditions of the physical infrastructure, not only in the non-sugar agricultural sector, but also in the sugar agricultural sector. So, the emerging agricultural model is facing all these challenges. So part of the process since 2007 and 2008 has been to reform, to transform the agricultural sector. And so the, the, the most significant reforms, and I'm sure many of you are familiar, uh, I look around the room and I see many people that come to our events and they hear us talk about agriculture <laughs> constantly, and of course we have price reforms. Th that those are moderate price reforms that are taking place in the agricultural side to stimulate production and also to, to stimulate consumption. Um, the second, of course, is uh, liberalization of agricultural prices. And what that means, of course, is removing products away from the rationing system. And then we have structural reforms, the fusion of some ministries, consolidation of some ministries, and the most significant one, I think, is the replacement of the Ministry of Sugar with this holding company known as Ascuba. And then, the transfer, which I mentioned before, of land that's idle from the state sector to the non-state sector. And there, uh, the, despite of, the, of those transfers that have taken place from 2008 all, all the way until the present, 15% of the land 
remains idle. 15% of the total agricultural surface remains idle. And then the final reform, of course, has been the gradual uh, liberal, you know, relaxation of commercialization of agricultural products. That's a big deal in Cuban agriculture because up until 2008, 2009, the distribution of agricultural products was very centralized, extremely centralized. And then finally, we have some new price reforms in 2015 to basically uh, provide economic incentives for non-state producers to increase their output and hopefully lower prices. The government is very concerned with inflation, food inflation, and agricultural inflation in Cuba. So those are the reforms. Now, in terms of indicators, we have plenty of indicators, but there are two that I really want to talk about very briefly. And the table that you see here uh, shows the distribution of land based on tenure comparing 2007 and 2014. And, and two trends I noticed when I looked at these numbers. First of all, we have a, a major significant redistribution of land away from the state sector to the non-state sector. If you look at agricultural land only, which I highlighted in blue here, you'll notice that in 2007, the state sector had 57%, 53% of the agricultural land. In 2014, only seven years later, the share of the state sector of agricultural land declined to 30%. So you can see the trends right there that I highlighted on, the, on that box to the right-hand side of the screen. Now, the other trend is that although Cuba, you know, people talk, of course, about tourism, they talk about services, medical services, they, there, there's even people talking about the potential of Cuba to become a maquila, like an assembly uh, facility in the Caribbean and all that. The fact of the matter is that agriculture has continued to expand. And, and the way that we can show that is by looking at the amount of land dedicated to agriculture. And so here I show you the amount of land dedicated as a ratio of the total dedicated to agriculture back in 2007, 40%, 40.2%. 40 in 2014, 57% of the total land or I should say the agricultural land represented 57, close to 60% of the total surface. Now, the total surface of Cuba, the total land surface, is around 11 million hectares. That is the size of all the Caribbean islands combined. So you can see why Cuba, you know, agriculture has a potential to be one of the engines driving the Cuban economy in the future. And the government, by the way, recognizes that at the present time. Something else, the, the, uh, the amount of agricultural land in Cuba, uh, the total surface in Cuba is the size of the state of Ohio, which is a major agricultural producer in the United States. It's about 60% the size of Florida. So Cuba has plenty of land, plenty of potential. We're, they're only utilizing 57%. Now, I know the whole island cannot be converted into cropland, but you can see the change. So the other number, that, the other figures that I show you here are the increases in agricultural land. And you can see that agricultural land increased by 42.2% from 2007 to 2014. That is the effect of the reforms. People say, we cannot quantify the reforms. Well, here they are quantified. You can see the increase in the agricultural land. Now, output, production. Mixed picture regarding production, I just want to talk about the numbers that you see in red, particularly at the bottom here. It is a well-known fact that Cuba has the capacity to, to gain a competitive advantage in the production of oranges and grapefruit. Back in 1994, at the beginning of the special period, the production of oranges and grapefruit were accounted for the bulk of exports to, uh, from Cuba to Western Europe, by the way. And 60% of all the processed agricultural products in, in, in 1993, in probably one of the worst years in the, of the special period, were grapefruits that were processed. Um, when we look at production, bear in mind, and I'm making a quick <coughs> historical reference to the special period, that agricultural output, non-sugar output, declined 54% from 1989 to 1993. So the starting point for Cuba, we have to take that into account. So if you compare these numbers, as terrible as they look for 2013, with 1993, they're much better than 1993. But production is insufficient. For example, rice production has increased. If you look at it, it has gone up by 54%, but Cuba has to import 50% of the rice that it consumes. 
So it creates issues pertaining to agriculture. Okay, so what's, what are the prospects for the agricultural sector after you know, carefully following up with the Congress of the, the seventh Congress of the, of the Communist Party? What are the prospects? Well, I think one of, one of the <coughs> possibilities is that Cuba will continue to implement reforms to address those issues that are unresolved. And, and I think that th there's a broad consensus that the government will continue to look at agriculture as one of the pillars for the Cuban economy. The second one is, and they recognize this too, the need to expand the wholesale market. And it's not just a matter of creating more wholesale markets, it's a matter of creating wholesale markets where agricultural producers will be able to buy agricultural products in correspondence with their real purchasing power. There's some, uh, you know, I, I was in, in Cuba in February and I talked to someone who manages a, a, a hard currency store. And I said, well, everything that the farmers need, they could purchase here. And they said to me, off the cuff, they said, well, sure they can, but they have to purchase these goods in, you know, using the convertible peso. And that has a negative impact on their purchasing power because most of these farmers that you're talking about, he said to me, are people who get paid in, in Cuban pesos. So they have to deal with the distortions of the dual currency. So it's not just the development of input markets, but input markets where prices correspond to the real purchasing power. Another um, possibility after reading and following the, what, what's taken place in the Congress is the diversification of production, of productive forms, increasing the role of the non-state sector, cooperatives, usufructuarios, private farmers, and all that. Number four, diversifying agricultural commercialization. Although Raul said Acopio will still continue to play a critical role, but recognizes the need for diversifying agricultural commercialization, increasing direct sales to the population, uh, expanding outlets, and so on. And then finally, the labor market, allowing farmers to hire labor based on anticipated demand, output decisions, productivity, and so on. So that's where it's pointing. But just to wrap it up, just to finish up, I thought about this and I followed all the discussions. And there's so many questions pertaining to Cuban agriculture that came to mind as I thought about what happened during the uh, seventh uh, Congress of the Communist Party. So for instance, the first question is, do, will the Cuban government have the political will to transform the way that credit financing is offered to agricultural producers. In other words, are they willing to provide producers additional sources of credit and financing? Are, are they, do they have the political will to allow microfinance to enter the agricultural realm? In relation to foreign investment, is there the willingness, that's a question that I have, for the, to allow, you know, joint ventures between private farmers and individuals who may have an interest in participating in the agricultural sector. What about private agricultural finance? I think I, after reading the speech from Raul again on my way here, I have some of the answers to that. Joint ventures between non-state enterprises, meaning private farmers, micro enterprises, and so on, and foreign investors. Where is the opportunity for that? Will there be an opportunity for that? The third issue that comes to mind is the dual currency. When, how, we don't know, nobody knows. And what will be the impact on agriculture? And then US-Cuba relations. Increase, will better relations more than likely lead to an increase of US agricultural exports to Cuba? And what will be the impact on Cuban agriculture in terms of production, employment, prices, consumption, and finally, I thought about Cuba being a very open economy, regardless of the embargo, it's a, it has a high level of external sector dependency. And so my question is, will greater or closer relations with the United States, how will that impact the trade balance, right, the merchandise trade balance with Cuba, and what would it do to its external sector dependency? So I leave you, <laughs> perhaps, with more questions um, than answers, but uh, my final closing remark is that agriculture matters and uh, Cuba is, and I think will remain forever, an agricultural country. Thank you.
You know, the Cuban socialism has had, you know, what I'm trying to do is put uh, the current Congress in histor historical and perspective. Uh, Cuba has had uh, probably five or six <laughs> major cycles of reform. Or if you will, the evolution of Cuban socialism can be seen in five, uh, six phases. The 60s, which was an era of experimentation, collapsed with the uh, 10 million dollar, 10 million harvest, 10 million ton harvest of sugar, which in 1970. And then we got, we went back into the institutionalization, which lasted uh, through 85. So a period of experimentation, conscientia, charisma, voluntarism, experimentation, giving way toward planning toward uh, reforms of various kinds, farmer's market, and uh, the like. That lasted until 1985. Now, that's a critical year, isn't it? Last night, Perestroika in the Soviet Union. Cuba had a, uh, was doing extremely well in those years uh, in terms of material wealth compared to what happened before and after. Uh, 85, Gorbachev goes one way, Cuba goes, Fidel goes the other. We have rectific rectification, which is going exactly opposite to what the Soviets were doing, emphasizing more of a, in my, in my analysis, more of a charisma, charismatic thing, more of the same st kind of breaking action on, on the reforms that had existed before. By 1990, Cuba no longer could, so here we see a transition. Uh, 1990, Cuba could no longer go that route because of the collapse of the Soviet Union. So between 1990 and 2008, we have a post-Soviet era, a special period, and then, then we have a socialist, what I call socialist reaffirmation, comparable in some ways to rectification. 1998, 2008, that has to do with the external condition, Chavez, Fidel's, uh, Cuba doing better, and so on and so forth. And then what happened, the question is, what is happening since 2008? Are we in the middle of a turning point toward reform, toward something else? And that is a question that I address. I think we are clearly the first part of that uh, cycle, 2000 Raul's takeover in 2008, to, and, uh, was, and then 2010, 11, the elections, was clearly a period of uh, reform. And Raul, is, we all know about the very extensive uh, remarks and plans they developed to, to reform Cuba. Toward, uh, and then since then, the question is, what happens in 2016? Many of us were, expect, were expecting a, a acceleration of a turning point. So after, after that moment, we have this, uh, this return the, that we were hoping would be a turning point and the question that I have for you and for me and for all of us is, are we in the middle of a turning point or are we going to go back as we did in 2006, in 19, I'm sorry, 1990, and after the reforms of the special period? And I think the, the evidence that we have for, from the speakers suggests that we don't really know for sure, though maybe we are. But then if we hear what happened, the actual outcome from the uh, Congress is that uh, they're, they're postponing the key, the main issues until later, right? They are, they did not make a number of decisions that are hard to be made now, and it's unclear exactly what direction Cuba is going, at least for, all, for many of us. So I would say that uh, the business, the private sector, the investors from the outside, Americans were expecting a more kind of open economy, a more, more open environment to investments. I mean, I, the, I mean, the consensus is they are not going as fast uh, as they thought. I mean, it's moving, but not as fast as before. So yes, see, uh, gradually, but slowly. The question is how slowly, and it's gonna be on time. Meanwhile, Cuba is hard pressed with a generational transformation, transition, I mean, the ruling elite is in their 80s, uh, the, the average age of the uh, of the Politburo is 76 or something like that, or lower. Lower, yeah. Well, it came down a bit, but it's still pretty high. 
and they, they themselves say they want to transfer power to a new generation. They have problems of, of expansion, of economic growth. I mean, if you compare what's happening in Havana and Matanzas, which is where a lot of the investment and tourism is, with what's happening in Camagüey and Oriente, it's very different. Camagüey and Oriente is agriculture, and it's not going as fast as the, as the investment. And we will show that in, uh, when, we, when we meet again on May 26. May 31st. Yeah, May, May the 31st, sorry. So I'm just trying to be provocative to raise questions about uh, the extent to which we are in the middle of a turning point toward a new model, if you will, or whether we are in that swing, that pendulum that I referred to before and that I have alluded to several times before. Many authors, Carmen López Salago, many people in Cuba have discussed that uh, kind, of, kind of pendular pattern historically. The hardliners, John, you mentioned uh, what do you call them? Not uh, orthodox. You mentioned uh, you, you mentioned the base and the. You well, mentioned the question was whether going to the base was. A but the other, the other group, the, the base versus what versus. Well, the, no, the, the debate was whether the the caution about going to the base was because the base was more conservative, or whether the base would actually make greater demands for transformation. And as I say, I. I Totally credible people argued it both ways. So. All right, both ways. So we don't know. We don't know. So I'm, all I'm doing is raising questions that need to be addressed. And perhaps I think I'm going to stop here and then ask us, all of us to ask questions of the, all of the panelists, and then we can begin to address some of those issues.